Once upon a time. So many of the fairy tales that we tell children before going to sleep start like this. Once upon a time. And if we are told of fantastic and mysterious creatures, we are willing to believe it more if this formula is recited. But when the inexplicable knocks on our door, fantasy surpasses reality, and the things we experience haunt us for life. All we have left is the telling of their story, their narration, the nightmare that was. There are thousands of stories of close encounters of the third kind, and usually they tell of sightings, kidnappings and manipulations of reality. But there are a few stories, unlike the one we are going to tell, that speak of a real night of horror. Imagine being at your home and suddenly finding a grotesque creature at your front door. What would you do? Would you try to make contact with it? To communicate with it? Would you invite it in? And what if this fantastic creature comes closer and closer to you in a threatening way and violently tries to attack you? How would you react in that case? Now think of that creature and imagine seeing it multiply incessantly. A vast number of monsters begin to assail your house, trying to enter and touch you. They reach out their arms to grab you. You cannot know the creature's intentions and you cannot even risk it. Here you are, in a terrible story like this, and whatever your reaction, there is a common feeling that assails you and envelops you, that masters your next actions. And that feeling is fear. There is no moment of greater danger than when you are safely locked inside your own home and something tries to enter against your will. Think about this as you listen to our story because the reactions of people who have been victims of it can only be comprehended if you understand, you realize the true meaning of fear. The creature on your doorstep now goes away, leaving you alone and after the fear passes, only the story remains to be told. Once upon a time, in the mid-1950s, there was Hopkinsville, a quiet town in Christian County in the state of Kentucky, where the days go by calm and sunny. The hours pass on the picturesque clock tower of the old fire station. Like any other American city, ordinary people go to work. Children go to school. There are those who come for their holidays and those who carry out their daily duties. It's hot. It's the height of summer. The sun is scorching during the day and some take refuge in a cafe to try to cool off a little bit. Then night falls, bringing a light, refreshing breeze. On a summer night like this one, August the 21st, 1955, the silence is broken by the screech of tires on the asphalt. Two cars cross the main road and then come to a stop in front of the police department. The night shift officers are immediately alarmed. There is something wrong. A moment of suspense, then the doors open and eight adults with three children get out of the cars. They are some of the inhabitants of the farms in the surrounding plains, bordering Kelly. They are confused, exhausted and visibly in shock. They ask the police for help. Something terrible has just happened in their home. Something they couldn't stop from happening, despite trying. They fought hard, but they couldn't stop them. Somebody talks about a fight lasting more than three hours. The confused officers ask the men to calm down and begin their account of the facts. Two men come forward in absolute terror 
and begin to tell their story. Kelly is a leafy community in Christian County, crisscrossed by a highway and a railroad, composed mostly of sparse country homes. Lucky Sutton is spending a few months at his mother Glenny's house, near Kelly Station. He lives in the house with his wife, his mother, his brother, his sister-in-law, his sister-in-law's brother, and, in addition to Glenny's other three small children, also his friend and colleague Biddy Ray Taylor and his wife are spending some time with them. A quiet Sunday off, and the Suttons are all spending it together. The evening passes pleasantly. Adults and children enjoy themselves in a carefree manner, eating, chatting and playing card games. Life in the country is simple, and they are good people who enjoy the company of their friends and family. Despite the young age of the men present, there is a common denominator in all of the witness accounts of what happened that night. Not a single drop of alcohol is consumed at the dinner table or throughout the evening. It is well known that Glenny is a very religious woman and does not compromise on alcohol. Not even a bottle is opened in her house. The days in that period are much longer. The sun is only now starting to drop below the horizon, leaving just that little amount of light needed to see the silhouettes of the trees surrounding the house. Around 7pm, Billy Ray offers to fetch some water and leaves the house with a bucket in his hand, heading for the well in the backyard. The Sutton's dog is resting outside. In front of him, the large forest surrounding the house. Arriving at the well, Billy Ray throws the bucket in, and while he retrieves it, he is forced to raise his head towards the sky. Something bright, an intense silver light, catches his attention. The Suttons hear the door open abruptly. It is Billy Ray, who returns breathlessly into the house. He says he saw a shiny silver object, followed by a rainbow beam, fly over the house without making a sound, until it landed on the other side of the field, miles away, and then disappeared into the trees. There is one thing Billy Ray is quite sure about. It is definitely a flying saucer. 1955 is ablaze with science fiction images, full of flying saucers, aliens with bizarre figures, and the taste for the unknown coming from space populates mass culture. Stories of aliens trying to conquer the Earth, or space explorers from other planets involved in breathtaking action adventures. This is why the young man is so sure of what he saw. Thus, the Sutton family burst out laughing and do not believe poor Billy Ray's story. After all, he is just a young boy. One mustn't take him too seriously. Also, Lucky is used to his friend's pranks, so they all decide to ignore him and avoid going back to the matter. But Billy Ray knows what he saw, and his story remains the same. He is convinced he saw a flying saucer. About an hour passes when the chatter of the Sutton family is interrupted by the insistent barking of their dog. Lucky, taken aback, leaves the house to check, and Billy Ray, who probably already thinks the worst, follows him to understand what's going on. As soon as they are outside, the two see the dog darting past them with its tail between its legs. They are perplexed. It is certainly unexpected behaviour for a dog who is used to sleeping outside in the countryside. But the forest hides the answer to their questions. A strange luminescence that seems to come from the darkness reflects on the leaves of the trees. A light that heralds the arrival of something. Then, out of the dark night, emerges a small figure, which they would then describe to the police 
as something like this. About three and a half feet tall, with arms so long that they almost touch the ground. Disproportionate hands with long fingers. Its head, much larger than its body, seems to have a perfectly round shape. Its large pointed ears frame two huge eyes that give off a yellow light. The entire body of the little man releases a grey luminescence that the two boys are unable to describe in any other way than as if it were made of a particular and unknown silver metal alloy. In addition, this creature does not appear to walk like normal human beings, but rather floats a few inches off the ground. It is very difficult to understand what kind of creature they found themselves facing. For this reason, the term that is often used to describe this being is that of the Goblin. Like the fantastic creatures that populate the world of fairy tales and popular folklore. Kelly's Little Grey Goblin Incredulous at this vision, Lucky and Billy Ray are amazed when they see the creature throw its arms towards the sky as it moves towards them. What does it want? Why is it approaching in such an intimidating manner? And this is where fear sets in. Perhaps thinking of the women and children in the house, the young men's instinct for self-defense springs into action. In a panic and under threat, the two men return to the house and arm themselves with a rifle, a 20-gauge shotgun and a large quantity of bullets, ready to defend their family and their home. Galeni and all the others don't realize what's going on and can't understand why the two boys are out of breath. Could this be just another one of their jokes? In the meantime, the little grey man gets closer and closer, floating in a sinister way towards the house, its arms raised as if to try to grab something or to attack from a distance, and it is at this point that the questions of the other members of the family get a clear answer to. From the door of the house, everyone can clearly see the silver goblin. It is definitely not one of the boy's jokes. Galeni screams in fear, the children panic, and even the adults can't seem to keep their calm. The unknown is at their door. Hearing the screams of their families, Lucky and Billy Ray finally gather their courage and fire the first shots. Against all odds, the bullets make a sound like when a tin can is shot. And this result is certainly not the one they desired. The creature, instead of collapsing to the ground to die, makes a strange leap backwards and then disappears completely into the darkness of the forest. In general disbelief, there are a few moments of silence. The next few minutes feel like hours, minutes that Lucky and Billy Ray spend waiting, tense, until a scream coming from the living room sets them off again. The rest of the family is there, the women are pointing to the window. The two men see the creature looking in, its bright yellow eyes examining the interior of the room. They don't think twice about giving it the same treatment as before. They take out their rifles and shoot, making huge holes in the glass window panes. Once again, the little being does a somersault on itself, but this time it seems that it has been hit. Encouraged, the men decide to go out to check. Outside, everything is silent. Billy Ray, at the door, glances out. No trace, not even a small silvery body lying on the ground, only the peace and silence of the dark country night. He reassures the family that there is no danger out there, that the monster is probably gone. But suddenly, the women, the children and Lucky, who is immediately behind him, see a hideous silver hand emerge from around the doorframe, intent on grabbing poor Billy Ray by the hair. Everyone yells at Billy Ray to move, 
but only Lucky manages to push his friend out of the house, narrowly saving his life. Instinctively, Lucky Sutton takes up his rifle and shoots through the door, making a hole in the ceiling. But once again, he seems to have failed to hit anything but the house itself. Out in front of the trees, Billy Ray sees more strange movements. The creature is not alone. There are others. They seem to move very fast. One comes down from the trees, another comes from behind the house. At first, the two men shoot in all directions to keep them away, but when they see that the bullets achieve nothing but the usual somersaults, they decide to barricade themselves in the house, to be safe. Perhaps it is in this very moment, the family realizes that this is a real assault. The goblins want to enter the house, and God only knows what they want to do once they cross the threshold. The only way not to find out is to survive, and to survive, you have to fight. Everyone positions themselves to make sure they are safe. The children are taken to their rooms. Glenny starts praying to the Lord to drive away those demonic presences, and tries to reassure her children that they will no longer be able to sleep for the rest of the night. The following hours pass between disturbing noises of nails on the roof, sightings in different parts of the house, and several rifle shots to try to repel the threat. Despite all this, the creatures keep coming back, and it seems more and more of them every time. Exhausted, sleepless, and without any hope, at around 11pm, the Suttons and Billy Ray decide that alone they can do nothing against this horde of goblins. For them, there is only one extreme solution. To leave the house, get in their two cars, and head for the police station to ask for help. And that's what they do. Not without first grabbing all they can and piling the children into the cars. The closest outpost is obviously the Hopkinsville police station, a few miles away from Kelly, where our story began. The agents listen in disbelief to the whole story of the Suttons. Here are some adults who are reporting on at least a three-hour fight with little beings who attacked their home. And if there had been a shooting at the Sutton house, the only thing to do is to make sure of it. But something big is at stake here, and the officers decide to call for reinforcements. Among the forces deployed are county sheriff's deputies, state police, and some servicemen from Fort Campbell, the military base. Thus, the investigation of all these armed forces begins. Cars with sirens blaring arrive at the now deserted farmhouse, followed by the Sutton's cars. There doesn't seem to be even a footprint of those strange silver creatures on the scene of the crime. Torches are switched on as the authorities search far and wide around the house to look for as many clues as possible about these little strange beings. What most attracts the attention of the agents are the rifle shots inflicted on the house, which caused many windows to shatter. The floor is covered with a huge amount of shell casings scattered all around. There had definitely been a shooting and someone was frightened by something very dangerous. All the participants in this strange event, namely the Suttons and Billy Ray, are questioned individually, and the agents must ascertain that each version seems to fit perfectly with everybody else's description of the facts. It cannot be denied that something happened on that farm. But what? There are no traces of extraterrestrial presence in the vicinity. It is very easy to disbelieve the Sutton story if one wasn't present at the assault. Some agents seem to see faint lights coming from the woods, but despite going to check, they can't find anything at all. Unfortunately, 
After various checks and investigations, the night brings no indication of the presence of any alien creatures, and after a few hours, the agents leave the scene, saying they are safe. They call off the alarm and declare that the area is clean. The Suttons can now return to occupy their home, confident that the threat has finally disappeared. They decide to sleep on it and try to recover the night's rest, to get rid of all their fear. It is around 2.30 a.m. The Suttons' farm is now completely dark, and everyone is asleep. Neither humans nor alien creatures appear to be nearby. Lucky is sleeping on the sofa in the living room, his shotgun next to him. The children are in the rooms with the others. Glennie is in bed in her room, perhaps the only one in the family who still can't sleep. She has been trying for a while already when she suddenly sees a strange light coming through the window. Another of those creatures pops out and leans against the glass, its claw extended high, as if to try to open the window to enter. As before, the goblin observes the interior of the room, as if to spy on who is occupying it. Glenny screams in terror. Lucky wakes up with a start, grabs his shotgun and runs up the stairs. Arriving in his mother's room, he cannot believe it. The nightmare has returned. Without thinking twice, the boy raises his rifle and fires a shot at the window. The creature does a somersault on itself and disappears into thin air. Why do these beings want to enter their house? Why so much insistence, given that their first meeting wasn't so peaceful? What do they want from them? Probably, the Suttons will ask themselves these questions for the rest of the night, and the nights to come. More time passes. Lucky and Billy Ray stay awake, alert, with rifles in hand and more cartridges ready to be fired. But they hear nothing, apart from a few scratches on the roof. They go outside to check every once in a while, but can't see any creatures. Then, at dawn, the nightmare ends, and the goblins disappear into thin air, without a trace. As they appeared in the night, when the day comes, they are gone. The little grey goblins would never be seen again. What the Suttons are unaware of, however, is that more trials await them in the days to come. The news spreads very quickly, first throughout the city, then throughout Christian County, then throughout the state of Kentucky, and finally throughout the whole nation. Everyone is talking about the Kelly Hopkinsville assault on the night of August the 21st, August the 22nd. A few days after that fateful night, the poor family is forced to suffer another invasion perhaps the hardest to face, and the longest. Agents, journalists, and the curious begin a real invasion of the farm. They come from all over the country to see the site of the alien attack. Many come to verify with their own eyes if the stories told by those people are true. Many others come to mock and deride them. The quiet and isolated country farm is filled with cars that come and go, incessant flashes from cameras, hordes of unknown people. Some even sneak into the house to steal souvenirs of the most famous place in Kentucky. In addition to this assault, a further insult is insinuated. Rumours are spread that the Suttons are not reliable people, and that that famous night they were all drunk, despite the fact that the family had already declared to the police that no alcohol was ever consumed that evening. Unfortunately, 
Many people find it hard to believe the Sutton story, and they soon get tired of these constant attacks and decide not to accept anybody's visits anymore. Their home cannot become a circus full of skeptics who just come to make fun of them. The Suttons close off all access to everybody and post a sign in front of their house that reads, No Trespassing. Years go by and an event such as this one never happens again, neither at the Sutton home nor nearby. So the story becomes village folklore, then a legend. But there is still one last chapter in the Sutton story. We have told you of how this family was harassed and made fun of by all those people who never believed them. Well, we must never think that these incidents have no consequences. About 10 years later, the family leaves the house where they spent the best moments of their lives together and they will never return there again. Fortunately, interest in the case also reaches more competent places and people who, in any case, do not produce the hoped-for conclusions. Since 1951, it is the US Air Force that has been investigating all cases of sightings of unidentified flying objects in much of the US territory. Their goal is to evaluate whether most of these UFOs could become a real threat to the security of the United States of America. It is therefore necessary to scientifically analyze, validate, classify and study all cases of suspected UFO close encounters of the third kind. All of these case studies are included in the project which takes the name of Project Blue Book. The case of Kelly's Goblins obviously attracts the attention of the Blue Book agents. And it is precisely from Fort Campbell, the military base closest to Kelly, that agents arrive to investigate the site of the incident directly. Discretion is a predominant characteristic of those who study these cases. In fact, it is only later discovered that Project Blue Book had actually sent investigators. The United States Air Force investigators reconstruct all the events, investigate the location of the incident, they come into possession of key testimonies, witnesses and even documents, such as the identikit of the aliens created by local police officers. If little alien beings attacked a home for an entire night, what could prevent them from causing even greater turmoil in the entire nation? In the Project Blue Book report, an attempt is also made to prove the arrival of the unidentified flying object above the Sutton house, the beginning of everything, Billy Ray's initial story. And this is actually the hardest thing for the Suttons to prove. When Billy Ray returns home on the evening of August the 21st with his story of the flying saucer, it is precisely where the skepticism of all those present during the evening begins. During that same night, after the local police investigate the location of the incident, many police officers claim that they found absolutely nothing to prove the occurrence of such a fact. There is nothing at the location where Billy Ray saw the flying saucer land, although some claim to see a strange smoothing of the ground where some flying vehicle could have clearly landed. But many details of the story told so far coincide with those of a close encounter of the third kind, on a large scale. Close encounters are very particular events studied by ufology experts. When an individual reports an encounter or sighting with an unidentified flying object, 
and living beings associated with it. Over the years, researchers of these cases have managed to categorize three kinds of close encounters. A close encounter of the first kind, which concerns the sighting of a UFO understood as a flying vehicle unrecognized among those used by humans, or strange floating lights. And we can be pretty sure, without Billy Ray even realizing it, that his testimony falls into this category. A close encounter of the second kind, on the other hand, refers to all those changes or strange facts that occur after a direct encounter with an alien presence. Traces on the ground, memory lapses, interference. In Kelly's case, there is an element that stands out in this category, and it is the strange behavior of the dog before the arrival of the creatures. The animal barks insistently and then runs away with its tail between its legs when the two men go out to check, a fact that amazes both of them. And finally, a close encounter of the third kind alludes to the encounter with a being, an entity, following a UFO sighting. The Suttons have had more than one sighting and more than one close contact with unidentified creatures. Although the presence of some Project Blue Book agents at the scene is reported, the case was never considered to be of official interest to the US Air Force. And, after many years of investigation, Project Blue Book was closed by filing all cases as of no interest to UFO studies, nor of relevance to the security of the entire nation. Which is a very strange fact since many of the cases in which their agents were involved, including the Kelly Hopkinsville case, carried evidence and testimony of sightings, abductions, close encounters, and even, as in this case, direct attacks on civilians. After the closure of Project Blue Book, many of the reports which the investigators had worked on over the years are available, unencrypted on the internet for everyone to read. Most of the time, in these incidents, two distinct factions form. Those who believe in the facts that have taken place, and those who are skeptical and tend to question the whole story. Over the years, there have been many figures who have investigated the case, and some have even managed to reconstruct the important elements of the story. First of all, these goblins, as they have been called, have extremely curious characteristics to observe. Their physiognomy, in fact, is very particular and is not very common in other similar or specular cases. On the contrary, it would seem quite unique. The fact that these creatures, in the Sutton's description, have fantastical elements, such as large ears, bright yellow eyes, their small size, and their body's silvery luminescence, opens up an interesting new study on the appearance of extraterrestrial beings. Even if they have some similarities with other alien species, such as the greys, very long arms and fingers, similar colouring and a disproportionate head, it has always been difficult to find these distinctive elements in other alien species. However, even their similarities with other races can only prove their origin from another planet. The thing that most fascinates us about these creatures, however, is their behavior. They show up in the night, advancing towards their victims, floating a few inches or a few feet above the ground, raising their arms to the sky. It is still not clear whether this last gesture is a declaration of surrender or an offensive action.
It is very strange that someone who wants to surrender would insistently advance in a threatening manner for an entire night, trying to enter the home of its victims at all costs. Then there is the event of the goblin above the door trying to grab Billy Ray's hair. An indisputable intent, one might think. Yet some over the years have tried to question the intentions of these aliens. Whatever the case may be, it seems that arms and hands are an important means of communication for these beings. Even the goblin that Glennie sees at her window has one hand resting on the glass, extended upwards. Most likely, the creatures want to say something with the use of their hands, whether it be something positive or negative. Or they may have a special sensitivity that allows them to feel something that we don't understand. Then there is the question of their alleged invulnerability. Because all the rounds that Billy Ray and Lucky shot at these goblins, and they shot a vast amount, given how the house was peppered with damage and the quantity of shell casings that the policemen found on their first inspection, didn't kill or injure the beings. The men speak of a clanging noise, like bullets deflected by a tin can, which surely accounts for their silvery composition. But how is it possible that two men spend all night shooting at living creatures without effect, without leaving any trace of injuries, wounds or any bodily substance? Once hit, the goblins all have the same strange reaction, a backward somersault and then fleeing into the darkness. Most likely, these beings feel pain, but only superficially. Yet there are those who sustain the hypothesis of the importance that these creatures have with light and dark. Light and dark seem to be two constant motifs of these creatures. Their bodies are luminous. Their arrival is always heralded by an almost biological luminescence, and their eyes emit yellow light. Yet, to defend themselves, they run away into the darkness of the forest. As soon as they see light, like the sparks fired from a rifle, for example, they flee, and their onslaught lasts until the wee hours of dawn, when the sun begins to rise. There is still debate about these details of light and dark. Then there is the most important testimony that most of those who have studied this case consider less, or do not consider at all. And it is that of poor Billy Ray. The boy sees what he specifically describes as a luminescent silver flying saucer, followed by a rainbow trail, flying in total silence over the Sutton house, which then lands in the woods a little further away. This is the key that defines these creatures as extraterrestrials. Their arrival at the house coincides with the landing of an unidentified flying object in the surrounding area. In the years following the incident, many speculations and investigations on the Kelly case were performed to try to reconstruct the whole story. Where Project Blue Book completely failed to detect the presence of extraterrestrial beings, many interested in the matter, even skeptics who just want to discredit the incident, have reported their opinions. 55 years after the event, when things have settled down and no one talks about the incident involving the Suttons anymore, a group of people look for a way to create something that would draw attention to the Kelly incident. Something that can sell, and that can bring tourists to the area. So, they investigate the city archives and dig up the story of the Goblin Case. A festival dedicated to the history of the Sutton Farm is thus established and publicised. There are parades, 
festivities, games and souvenir stalls, all dedicated to the goblins, or little green men, as they call them. On these occasions, there are many discussions on the matter, and various experts intervene to investigate the case, reconstruct the testimonies, and try to give an explanation, even two rational explanations, most of the time. On the occasion of one of these anniversaries, a paranormal investigator is hired to reconstruct the story and shed light on some of the facts. So, 50 years later, the case is reopened. The investigator interrogates all the witnesses who are still alive, visits the locations of the facts and consults all the documents of the city archives of both Kelly and Hopkinsville. He goes through all the statements once again and inspects the reports of the agents involved in the investigation in 1955. Then he discovers something, something that makes him strongly doubt the story as it was told. Let's start from the beginning. It's 7pm. Billy Ray has just left the house with the bucket, heading to the well. When he goes to retrieve the bucket, he looks up at the sky and sees a silver light pass over his head. Hurrying back, Billy Ray returns home out of breath and reveals to the Suttons what he saw. But what does Billy Ray say that he actually saw? In one of the very first statements, it would appear that the poor, scared boy told the Suttons that he saw a large shooting star that crossed the sky above their heads. Only in later reports is the mention of a flying saucer and a spaceship landing behind the trees. The investigator goes even further and also discovers something else. In the period of the incident, August 1955, in the Kentucky area, meteor showers occur that are known as the Kappa Cygnids, which are part of the meteor shower called Perseid. Meteor showers that are also seen from the Fort Campbell military base, a few miles from the farm. But there is always something that just doesn't add up. Why is the Project Blue Book interested in the case? And more importantly, why don't the Suttons believe Billy Ray's story when he tells it to them? If he talks about a bright meteor crossing the sky, what could be so strange as to not believe the boy? But above all, where do the silvery creatures enter the story? The investigator dwells on many other aspects that either enrich the elements of evidence or bring into doubt some details of the story. Fear can also lead to over-rationalizing. Many wonder, if there was a shooting in the silence of the night, did anyone nearby at least hear anything? Some of the neighbors of the Sutton farm say they never heard a thing on the night of August the 21st, 1955. Others, such as a nearby farmer, report the following. The man, who lives alone on a farm a few miles away from the Suttons, towards evening sees lights that surround his neighbor's house. At first, he thinks the Suttons have lost one of their farm animals and are looking for it in the forest. Perfectly normal behavior for a farm that raises animals. Some can escape, or worse, can be taken by other wild beasts to be eaten. Validating his thesis, later in the evening, rifle shots ring out from the Sutton farm. At this point, the man begins to think that some wild animal is threatening the neighbor's livestock. This too, a normal occurrence in country life. The danger will remain until these animals leave his farm in peace. This testimony would contradict the police investigations 
which instead report the accounts of other neighbours who say they hadn't heard anything. But let's return to the experience the Suttons went through, and above all to that of Lucky and Billy Ray. There is in fact an important element that heralds the arrival of the goblins at the farm, which is the strange luminescence that comes from the forest, present in all the eyewitness accounts, including this last account from their neighbour. The lights, according to the narration of the facts, would seem to come from the flying saucer spotted by Billy Ray, and from the silver luminescence of the creatures themselves, or the yellow light from their big eyes. Then there is the policeman who, later that evening, says he saw faint lights coming from the trees, but afterwards found nothing. Those who try to rationalise the story too much speak of the glowing in the forest as deriving from foxfires, bioluminescent mushrooms that grow on the decomposing bark of trees, also in the sylvan areas of Kentucky. Mushrooms. This would be the rational answer. But what about the goblins? They speak of creatures of a certain height, with enormous arms, legs, eyes and ears on a disproportionate head, with a body that appears to be made of metal. Skeptics have attempted to rationalise this as well. In fact, it is said that in the area there is the presence of some species of birds, such as the great horned owl or the barn owl, and that their physiognomy is very similar to that described by the Suttons that night. Pointed ears, enormous yellow eyes, a disproportionate head with regard to the body, and a very pronounced wingspan. Furthermore, the summer period would be precisely the period in which these animals feed their young, and therefore become particularly aggressive with other living beings to defend their offspring. Therefore, according to these theories, a flock of owls would have attacked the farm non-stop for an entire night, trying to enter the house several times. But above all, without suffering the slightest effect from the shots fired by Lucky and Billy Ray, and without leaving a trace of blood or signs of injuries. They also tell of the sound that the bullets make on the bodies of these beings, of how their composition seems to be of a particular metal alloy, and of the fact that none of them suffer the slightest damage from firearms. Furthermore, the behaviour of the beings does not seem to correspond to an attitude of defence, but more an attitude of attack. Placing an entire family under attack for a whole night and being subjected to repeated gunshots that would frighten any animal, deterring it from any type of continued attack, does not appear to be the typical behaviour of a bird living in those areas. Among the most widespread scepticism, there is also that regarding the quantity of these owls that would have attacked the house. In fact, those who try to discredit the Sutton story tend to say that their story mainly refers to the presence of just two birds that show up in different moments during the evening, and that in reality this is not a swarm of goblins, but simply a few birds. Other doubters wouldn't approve of the owl theory, but rather prefer the crazier one that Billy Ray and Lucky brought back monkeys from a fair they worked at to play a trick on their family members. Fear creates different reactions in every one of us. It makes us react in an exaggerated way, perhaps in front of an event that is much more contained than what actually appears before our eyes, or it makes us believe that it is all an invention. An invention that we can question on the basis of theories and reasoning that we consider more logical, safer. The fact is that the Hopkinsville Kelly incident is more scary today than it ever was in the past. In one of the most recent recurrences, 
many were concerned about a particular situation that would arise. Indeed, 62 years later, a major solar eclipse coincides with the anniversary of the Sutton case. Many citizens await, on this precise occasion, the return of the aliens. Their intuition is correct. Once again, light as an element that distinguishes the arrival or departure of these beings. The advent of the goblins, which is marked by the anticipated fall of darkness. And many people show up from all over the United States to witness the return of the aliens. All gathered in Kelly. But when the eclipse arrives, however, nothing happens. Some swear that they have perceived something strange that day, that they have seen suspicious presences, or that they have found themselves in front of something inexplicable. But the aliens didn't come back to Kelly that day. As much as we try to anticipate it, the unknown is unpredictable, and although we can interpret some of its signals, we will never be allowed to fully understand what moves these mysteries. Today, Hopkinsville is still that quiet and cheerful town that appeared at the beginning of our story, almost always full of the comings and goings of people who live there and of those who pass by. Some people live there and some come for work. Others come and go to see the goblins. And Kelly? It too has been enriched here and there with that curious and amusing atmosphere that surrounds the case of the goblins. This is the power of stories, even when you can't accept that they are true. Even fear can be turned into commerce, entertainment and play. It is one of the ways that the inhabitants of planet Earth use to exorcise fear, to make less dangerous what we cannot understand so easily, what scares us the most. One could say that now aliens exist every day in Kentucky and that it is very likely that they will not go away so easily. Our story is almost over. We have arrived at its conclusion and we want some answers. But we ask ourselves questions that are difficult to answer. The monster at our door has gone away. And in order to tell our story, we try to remember. We do what we can to try to reconstruct, piece by piece, what happened and what we felt when we found ourselves in front of those creatures. We soon realize that the only solution is to talk about what we perceived, what we thought, how we reacted. If we are the protagonists of the story, we cannot help but focus on an infinite number of details that guide our way of telling our story. When we tell a fairy tale to a child, at the end of the story, after learning that the creatures have almost eaten the protagonist, the listener needs to be reassured and told that it is only a fairy tale. Only a story. And now, what will happen? What will our heroes do? How will they manage to solve their problems? Unfortunately, the truth is that real-life stories are not always reassuring, nor do they always have happy endings. Sometimes we may learn of events that we do not like at all, or that we just wish had never happened. However, just like fairy tales, these kinds of stories also have something to teach us, something that strengthens us and changes us, that gives us new perspectives. In this story, that of Kelly's goblins, 
There are facts. There are testimonies. There are stories of a group of people who found themselves in an out of the ordinary situation. Difficult to understand for anyone who hasn't taken part in it. Each of the protagonists of this story decided what was best to do for the good of their family. To protect their home. To counter an incomprehensible threat. If we are telling the story, or we are listening to the story, we can only take note of what happened. And instead of asking ourselves what our protagonists will do, each of us should ask ourselves the most diverse questions. What would happen to me? What would I do in a situation like this? How would I be able to solve my problems? How would I get out of all of this? When we transform stories into something that can lead to personal teachings, we can truly understand everything that is being told to us. But until we try to understand, empathize or assimilate to the individual elements, the only thing we can do is to rationalize everything. We can only reason about fear. The fear that drives us to tell the story. The fear that makes us do absurd things. The fear that seizes us when the story ends. There are stories that are so scary that they don't seem to be true. Making us try in every way to divert our imagination and look for more reasonable things. But when something we can't understand shows up in front of us, in our home, in front of our family, perhaps fear is the only way we have to express ourselves and make us react. The stories involving fear are always the truest, if we think about it, because they strike us deeply and make us react emotionally. Fear conceals itself in the smallest of details, in theories, when one tries to discredit others. That's how you know when you're afraid. When we cannot in any way admit to ourselves that there's something not right, that there are things we cannot explain, both within us and in the events that happen to us. We are surrounded by stories about aliens, UFO sightings, alien abductions, alien attacks. In the face of all these testimonies, it is very important to seek the balance between what we perceive and what the evidence is, the events as they happened. But stories of this kind, like the case of the Hopkinsville Kelly Goblins, are very rare. What we can learn from these close encounters is that the unknown is unpredictable and no matter how much we want to try to understand some events, we could never do it fully if we don't first put ourselves in the right conditions to accept them. We can think all we like and try to discredit many things we hear about these stories, but the courage to be there, to be able to react for the good of one's family and one's friends, is the most rational part of fear. The instinct that becomes will. Fear that turns into courage. Billy Ray's courage to tell of what he saw on the night of August the 21st, as he went to fetch water from the well. Lucky's courage to fight back and decide to face these creatures at all costs. Also Glenny's courage not to lose heart and to pray for all this to end. And finally, the courage to ask for help, to tell of what happened despite the fact this may lead to derision or skepticism. The Suttons have fought longer and harder with those who have always tried to discredit them and slander them than with those same creatures who attacked their home that night in 1955. 
They fought in order to stay together, to dedicate themselves to their family, to their future. Then they fought to reconstruct this story, to be told and described in detail, to let the world know what happened to them that night on their farm. Without their input, there wouldn't be as many details about this monumentous alien event. About this interesting case, where something new is always discovered every time it is told. This is true Sutton courage. Their legacy. Their fight with the goblins never ended that night. It was just the beginning. And their battle continues in the search for the truth about these events. Something that can only be found out there. Once upon a time.